which I think is, uh, everybody got that? Good. So Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. So you might have gathered if you've been joining us that some of these uh, sessions relate to courses that we do in the second semester, just a little bit of advertising. And in both of these uh, papers, I cover something on Mark's Gospel and interpreting the New Testament, a first year paper. And in my paper on Jesus in the New Testament, I cover a good deal on Mark. Uh, end of the advertising slot. So... I like to think of our four Gospels as four portraits of Jesus. And we're probably used to the idea of different portraits of a person emphasizing a different facet of their character. So I thought Martin Luther King would be an appropriate person to uh, bring up on screen. And you'll see on the left that uh, that emphasizes his, his life of faith. Uh, Lu Martin Luther King is a, is a man of prayer. In the middle, uh, we might think of this uh, photograph as emphasizing his uh, a man of a, leading a popular movement, leading thousands, tens of thousands of people uh, in, in protest uh, and drawing attention to the issue of racism. So here he is as a man of, of the people, a man with great uh, popular following. And on the right, uh, perhaps Martin Luther King as an orator, as a man who's a very powerful speaker, as uh, one who can move crowds and can uh, lead them as, as, a, as a speaker, as a teacher. So different portraits of the clearly the same person, emphasizing different facets of their life. Perhaps that's most obvious with John's gospel, when we think about uh, uh, John, uh, as to how John might paint his portrait of Jesus. And in verse 14, we have uh, the introduction of Jesus and the word became flesh and lived among us. Uh, and that word is, is Jesus, as, Mark, as John goes on to emphasize in a couple of verses. So Jesus is the word made flesh. And in verse one, he starts by saying that this word was with God and was God. And in verse three, all things came into being through him. So to understand the word made flesh in Jesus, we need to think of him as one who was with God, who was in fact himself God and was the agent of creation, verse three. So John is, if you like, painting his portrait of Jesus on the broadest possible canvas, uh, the canvas of the whole of creation. Well, how then does Mark's gospel present the person of Jesus? How might Mark paint his portrait of Jesus? What's special about it? That's what we'll be talking about tonight. So uh, I want to look, first of all, at what's often thought of as sort of a watershed, a crucial moment in, uh, in Mark. And so we've got here on the screen this passage from 827 to uh, 33. Uh, Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Getting personal. Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo a great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. So here is a bit of a crucial moment in the gospel. Uh, up till this point, there have been lots of questions about who is Jesus? Uh, how do we understand him? And here Jesus takes the initiative. Who do people say that I am? And then who do you say that I am? And clearly you are the Messiah is uh, at least part of uh, the answer. We'll develop that more in a minute. But then the second half of the passage, he goes on to talk about the necessity of his suffering uh, being killed and then rising again. So if you like, 27 to 30 are about Jesus's identity. Who do you say that I am? And then the second half of the passage about Jesus's destiny, what is going to happen to him? 
in many ways, the first half of the gospel leads up to that question of Jesus's identity. Who do you say that I am? And the second half follows that uh, thought of Jesus's destiny. What's going to happen to him? He's going to be killed and will rise again. In the first half of the gospel, then the question often comes up, who is this person, Jesus? Just look at these uh, passages where, and there are a number of others we could talk about, where the question arises in the narrative, who is this person? So 2.7, why does this fellow speak in this way? This is the scribe speaking. It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sin but God alone? Who, who is this guy? Who does he think he is? Mark 3, 21 to 22, when his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. The people were saying he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. Who is he? Well, he's crazy, uh, or he is demon-possessed. Or 4:41, and they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Jesus is uh, in the boat. He's just calmed the storm. Who then is this? Chapter 6, on the Sabbath day, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hand? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So he is in uh, his hometown, uh, Nazareth, and who, who does he think he is? Where did he get these things? Who is this man? So you see how in the first half of the gospel, this question keeps coming up time and again. Who does this man think he is? Who is he? How can we understand him? But in the same uh, first half of the gospel, the answer is often given, sometimes explicitly, sometimes implicitly, to this question. Who is this person, Jesus? So I want to just look now at some of the answers that Mark presents. The question arises in the narrative. The answer, or at least a whole range of answers, are given as well. So Mark 1, 14 to 15. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is almost the uh, sort of programmatic statement of the gospel. The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the gospel, the good news. So who is Jesus? He's the one who brings the kingdom. The kingdom comes because Jesus is here. The kingdom, the new rule of God, the new reign of God, setting things right on earth. God's power to set things right. So that's one answer. Who is Jesus? He's the one who brings the kingdom. Another passage shortly afterwards. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed and they kept on asking one another, what is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the region of Galilee. So who is Jesus? Well, he's the one who brings the kingdom, and the kingdom means the defeat of uh, opposition, the defeat of powers that might hold people captive, the defeat here of uh, evil spirits, unclean spirits who bind people and, and uh, destroy them, convulse them. So Jesus is the one who sets people free. But notice there's more than that going on here. Notice how Mark uh, begins the story with Jesus teaching. He's in the synagogue and he taught. And they're astounded at his teaching. 
for he taught them as one having authority, as the one who brings the kingdom. He has this amazing authority. And then he ends at verse 27, what is this a new teaching with authority? Now, in the middle, there's been an exorcism. So we might expect, mightn't we, in verse 27, what is this a new miracle worker or a new exorcist? or a new amazing person but no it's a new teaching so this is often called a, a mark and sandwich where it starts with teaching it ends with teaching the two slices of bread and in the middle is another incident uh, in this case an exorcism and the three things are to be seen together like a sandwich the two slices of bread and the bit in the middle are, are mutually interpreting so we're to look in the middle and see that this helps us to understand something about Jesus. And notice in verse 25 how Jesus does the miracle. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. So often miracle workers, we're told, might have done some sort of ritual, perhaps an anointing or some sort of incantation or action or um, pulling the demon out of nose or something like that. Here Jesus simply commands, be silent and come out of him. He speaks and it happens. So here's the link with teaching. Jesus's words are so powerful that he simply speaks and it happens. Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit has no choice but to obey. It's those same powerful words that Jesus uses when he teaches a new teaching with authority. The teaching is about the kingdom of God, an amazing thing that God is doing through Jesus. In the previous story, Jesus has called four disciples and he simply said, follow me, and they've come, the power of his words. So here the exorcism is important in itself, but it also functions as sort of an acted parable almost. It shows the power of Jesus's word, and that same word is his teaching of the kingdom of God. And they're astounded at his teaching for he has this amazing authority. So who is Jesus? He's the one who sets people free from demons, but he's also the one who teaches with this amazing, powerful word. And in fact, Mark calls Jesus teacher or says Jesus teaches 31 times. It's one of those emphases of Mark. It's focused on the kingdom. Jesus is teaching about the kingdom. Uh, and Mark emphasizes that. Just a couple of passages. He left that place and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds again gathered around him, and as was his custom, he again taught them. He's teaching them about the kingdom, and these are his amazing words with authority. Mark 5.35, while he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Again, in the context of a miracle, we might, because it goes, he goes on to bring the girl back to life, we might expect why trouble the miracle worker any further, but actually Jesus is a teacher. He's a powerful teacher with powerful words, and he can bring the girl back to life. Um, going a bit further on in Mark, Mark 2, here's another story where Mark again tells us something about who Jesus is. So he's leading up to that confession in uh, 827. Uh, here's another question of who is Jesus and an answer. So let's just have a look at this. When Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door. And he was speaking the word to them. He's a teacher. The word is the kingdom of God is at hand. Then some people came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Again, notice that's one of the questions I highlighted at the beginning. Uh, who is this guy? How do we understand him? 
or perhaps more harshly, who does he think he is? Uh, who can forgive sins but God alone? And of course, they're right. Uh, in the Old Testament, it's God who forgives sins. The high priest doesn't forgive. He announces that God has forgiven through a sacrifice and so on. At once, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves. And he said to them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up and take your mat and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Again, who is this guy? Notice verse 9, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk. Well, in some ways, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because you can't verify that. But stand up and take your mat and walk either works or it doesn't and in this case it does work the paralytic is healed uh, he gets up and goes home that more difficult thing is verification that jesus can forgive sins uh, the son of man jesus has authority on earth to forgive sins but to go back to the scribe's question in verse 7, why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Who is Jesus? The whole story raises that question. Well, he is in some way acting as God. He is forgiving sins. He's showing that he can do that by, raise, by uh, bringing the um, paralytic back to full health. He's showing that he can forgive sins through that action. And who can forgive sins but God alone? So again, another answer to this question, who is Jesus? He's the one who can forgive sins and somehow can act uh, in the place of God. Chapter four, a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. And he, Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So another of those questions at the end, how, how do we understand this Jesus? But notice two Psalms that would help us to understand. Psalm 107, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they had quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Well, Psalm 89, O Lord God of hosts, who is as mighty as you, O Lord? Your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. And that would be a united voice of the Old Testament. Who is the one who has power over creation? Who can calm the sea? It is God alone who can do that. Yahweh, Lord. So Richard Hayes writes in answer to the question, who then is this? For any reader versed in Israel's scripture, there can be only one possible answer. It is the Lord God of Israel. Who is Jesus? Well, he's the teacher, he's the healer, he brings the kingdom, but he is in some mysterious way acting uh, as God, sharing in who God is. And Mark does give us a good deal of that right back at the beginning. I started by drawing attention to John's prologue, uh, John 1, 1 to 18, and the beginning was the word. Well, Mark has a prologue too. It's not quite so um, set apart in, as in the way the Johannine prologue is, but it's very uh, powerful nonetheless. Uh, 
So Mark begins for us as readers by giving us a number of uh, uh, clear statements about who Jesus is. Uh, we won't go through all of them, but let me just highlight a few. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, Jesus Christ, Christ is the Greek word Christos. It translates the Hebrew word Messiah, which we would translate into English as Messiah. So in 8.27 uh, uh, to 30, when Peter says, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, we as readers have been told that by Mark from the beginning. The good news of Jesus, Messiah. He's also the Son of God. We'll talk more about that towards the end. But the Son of God as a title is one who's uniquely related to God. Then uh, Mark ties this back into the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And then verses four to eight tell us that the one who's the messenger in the wilderness is John the Baptist. The one who is crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. Now, of course, this is Isaiah 43 and prepare the way of the Lord is the way of Yahweh, the way of Israel's God. But here, the one that John prepares for is Jesus. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who even here can be given uh, its closest possible reference to Yahweh, just as we've seen Jesus forgiving sins or Jesus uh, as calming the sea, sharing in God's activity. So there's no question that Jesus is uh, a good human being, but he's much more than that. He also can be given... Uh, applied to him, Isaiah 43, prepare the way of the Lord. In verse 7, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. That's John the Baptist speaking. Jesus is the more powerful one. Why? I have baptized you, verse 8, with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He will uh, give you the Holy Spirit in such a uh, abundance that it can be thought of as a baptism, a covering with water, and it is again Jesus who gives the Holy Spirit. Verse 10, Jesus's baptism, just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. Who is Jesus? He's the one on whom the Spirit descends and remains. Uh, in the Old Testament, the Spirit would come for a time on a prophet uh, or on a king. But here the Spirit remains with Jesus. And he is my son, the beloved. So I hope you can see there, and we could spend a lot more time on this passage, that Mark is setting out in his introduction a number of facets of who Jesus is. Uh, answering this question, who is this man? If we'd look across this whole section, we would uh, be able to show, I think, this reasons why Mark came to see Jesus as uniquely related to God. What I like to call implicit Christology. Christology is words about Jesus, things that are implicit, not necessarily sort of spelt out in bold terms, but are implied by what he does. So a very high Christology, Jesus as uniquely related to God. Where does that come? Well, Jesus asserts, point one, that he is able to forgive sins. Only God could do this, as we've seen in Mark 2. He teaches on his own authority, doesn't depend on others. Passage we didn't look at three, he sees his mission and his own person as of sufficient significance to violate the God-given Sabbath. For he attributes to his own words the eternal validity of the word of God. That's Mark 13, 31. He chooses 12 disciples to be the nucleus of a restored Israel, not 11 plus himself. Jesus stands outside and above the renewed Israel, showing that he thinks of, uh, that he has a unique and distinctive role and status. He says that to reject or to receive him is to reject or to receive God. In Mark 4, he calms the storm and biblical language for God's triumph over the waters is used of Jesus. So a whole lot of answers are given then. Who is this man? 
he is one who is uniquely related to God. Of course, he's fully human. We talk with him and see him and eat with him, but he is also uniquely related to God. So looking at some of this sort of material, Larry Hurtado writes this. All of this indicates that Mark wished to emphasize that the one who offered his life as a ransom for many, get to that in a minute, is in fact far more than a prophet, messiah or mere man of any category. He is the son of God and is in some mysterious way divine. So the first half of the gospel focuses on that. It keeps going in the second half to some extent. And the answer that Mark wants to give is Jesus is a prophet, he is the Messiah, but he is in some mysterious way divine. But to go back to our watershed moment, we have in, in Mark 8, uh, Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man, notice the Son of Man, not the Messiah, but the Son of Man, an alternative title for Jesus, must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Now, how are we to understand all this mutual rebuking that goes on here? So, Jesus, Peter has just confessed Jesus as the Messiah. Well, they notice in verse 30, and he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. So, yes, I am the Messiah, but don't go telling people yet. Then he began to teach them the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be killed. He said all this quite openly, so it was clear what he was saying. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. So why does Peter rebuke Jesus? In a class I'd give you two minutes to talk to your neighbor, but I hope you have a chance to think about this. So why does uh, Peter rebuke Jesus? Well, Peter obviously does not want Jesus to suffer and to be killed. So here we come to the crucial idea about the Messiah. As far as we know, in first century Judaism, there's no idea that the Messiah, who was to be the agent of liberating the people, would actually suffer and die. Later, Christians will put together the suffering servant songs of Isaiah with Jesus and talk about Jesus as the suffering servant. But no one before Christians, before Jesus, before the early Christians reflecting on Jesus, had said that the Messiah would suffer. So when Peter says you are the Messiah, he's not thinking that Jesus will die. He's thinking that Jesus will get rid of the Romans, liberate the people, free them, a new uh, a redeemer, savior, liberator of the nation. And so Peter is rebuking Jesus for his idea of suffering. And that's why in verse 30 that uh, Jesus sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him because Peter at that point would be proclaiming the wrong sort of Messiah, a Messiah who was triumphant and victorious, not one going into Jerusalem on a donkey, but one going in on a stallion. Uh, armed to the hilt to get rid of the Romans. So if Peter was proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah, he would be proclaiming the wrong sort of Messiah because Jesus is the Messiah who will suffer and die. And in verse 33, Jesus rebukes Peter. This is wrong. Get behind me, Satan. Jesus almost is saying this is a, another temptation for me to follow that path of conquering Messiah but I'm not going to follow that path. I'm going to be suffering uh, and dying. That's divine things, not human things. So the first half of the gospel has been about Jesus as Messiah. Jesus also as teacher, as bringer of the kingdom, as the one who can forgive sins, who can walk uh, still the storm and so on, the one who is more than just 
a human Messiah. He's the son of God, uniquely related to God, Jesus's identity. The second half of the gospel then is about Jesus's destiny, which is to go to the cross. And Messiah and cross didn't go together. It's like hot ice. Hot ice is by definition not hot. Messiah's by definition did not die. So from this point on, Mark emphasizes the cross a great deal. Mark 10, 42 to 45, there are actually three passion predictions in Mark 8 to 10. This is the third of them. So Jesus called the disciples and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. Jesus is probably thinking of the Roman emperor, who's a tyrant par excellence, uh, lording it over others. But it is not so among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus is going to walk the talk. He teaches about becoming a servant and a slave, and he will live that out by not asking others to serve him, because the Son of Man came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus is going to Jerusalem to die, and his dying will be a ransom for many, a way of bringing redemption. The sort of field of meaning of a ransom is somebody buying back slaves. You might redeem them in the market by buying them, and that idea, metaphor, is the one Jesus is using. He is redeeming, buying back, liberating, setting free uh, from uh, sin and slavery and uh, uh, oppression uh, and so on in giving his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is on the road to the cross and this is why he will die. Of course, in the Last Supper, Jesus focuses again on this uh, giving his life. While they, Mark 14, 22, while they were eating, he took a loaf of bread and after blessing, he broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and all of them drank from it. He said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. My blood, my body are being given up they will be a new covenant. The word new is not used, but by the fact that this is Passover and Jesus is speaking of a covenant in his blood, he's clearly speaking of a new covenant. And his life is poured out, is given out for many, the ransom for many that they might be free. Identity, who is Jesus? He's the son of man, he's the son of God, and so on, he's the Messiah. What's his destiny? His destiny is that he will go to the cross to give his life a ransom for many. So perhaps then uh, we can see uh, a good deal in the way Mark actually recounts Jesus's death. So how is it that Mark tells about Jesus's death? So let's just have a look, uh, and we're uh, getting towards the end here, at uh, how Mark narrates Jesus's death. Mark 15, 33. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. And some one ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was God's son. 
Now, a couple of things to note here. So notice in verse 34, Jesus cries out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, Aramaic. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So here Jesus is dying on the cross and he prays this as part of Psalm 22. Now, has Jesus lost his faith? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We often talk about this as the cry of abandonment, and he feels abandoned. Does he lose his faith? Well, no, he still calls God my God. He still cries out to God. But in Mark 14, 36, uh, Jesus addresses God in the Garden of Gethsemane as Abba, Father, take this cup from me. And Abba is probably the normal word that Jesus uses for God. It's an Aramaic word meaning dad. It's one of great intimacy. As the son of God, Jesus can feel um, uh, a unique intimacy with God such that he can call God Abba. This is the only time in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus calls God, God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And notice the difference between calling God, God, and calling God, Abba, between calling God, Dad, an intimate and a familial term, to the distance of, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So here Jesus is feeling uh, remote from God, is feeling a great distance from God. Uh, and later theologians will go on to talk about uh, God, um, at the distance between God and Jesus as being uh, Jesus taking upon himself the, uh, the sin of the world, the um, sense of sin that clouds and impedes relationship between God and humanity is being taken by Jesus, and he is experiencing that God-forsakenness caused by sin. This is what it means to be a ransom for many. Uh, this is what it means to uh, be the blood of a new covenant uh, and to give his life for the world. So, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then Jesus, verse 37, uh, gives a loud cry and breathes his last, he dies. But then what happens? There is a, a response and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So this is the temple uh, in Jerusalem. Probably it's the curtain between the, the uh, holy part of the temple and the most holy, the holy of holies. It's torn in two from top to bottom. So this is probably a 10 meter high curtain, something like that. You can't tear such a curtain from the ground. Uh, you can't tear it 10 meters up from the ground. If it's torn from top to bottom, it must be being torn by God. This is a sense uh, in which the temple is um, bearing the impact of Jesus's death. So the Holy of Holies was the place where God was most thought to dwell. And now that place is accessible. Through Jesus' death, uh, that curtain is torn and the entrance into God's presence in the Holy of Holies is possible. Jesus' death has borne the penalty of sin, the price of sin, been a ransom for many, his, uh, his blood of the new covenant. And that means that humanity can enter into God's presence uh, in a new way. Now, when the centurion who stood uh, facing him, saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was God's son. Now, this is the first time in the gospel that a human being has confessed Jesus as God's son. These are the times in the gospel when this phrase, God, the son of God, uh, is used. In Mark 1.1, 1, 1, it's the title, the son of God. There is a textual issue there, but probably that's the best reading. Then in 111, a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. That's God speaking at Jesus' baptism. But unclean spirits know who Jesus is. 311, you are the son of God. And 57, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Those are both evil spirits. They have insight into who Jesus is. 
So right through the first half of the gospel, people keep asking this question, who is Jesus? And one answer is he is the son of God, but no one gets to that. The unclean spirits know, but no one in the story knows. In 9.7, the transfiguration, the voice from heaven, God, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. So at the baptism and the transfiguration, God, if you like, bears witness to who Jesus is. And then 1539, this passage we've been looking at. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was God's son. So this is the first human being who comes to this true and most right confession that Jesus is God's son. Mark, by that expression of Jesus as God's son, means one who's intimately related to God, who can call God Abba, who has the authority to forgive sins, who can calm the sea, who's uniquely related to God. It's a very high Christological title. So in verse 39, here, 1539, it's the centurion who comes to this confession, the first human being. So only in Jesus' dying is it clear who he is. It's been confusing up till now. But now we see who Jesus truly is. He's the one who is obedient to God. He is the one who has drunk the cup of suffering for the salvation of the world. He's the one who has gone the way of the cross. He is the one who is intimately related to God as Abba and yet has gone this way of dying. And who is the human being that comes to this confession? Well, it's the centurion. So this guy is a Roman. Okay, so he's not a Jew. He's a Roman and he's just killed Jesus. So even outsiders, rank outsiders, can come to faith in Jesus, like the centurion. And who does Jesus die for? Well, this guy has just killed Jesus, and yet he comes to the true confession of truly this man was God's son. So Jesus is a ransom for the sins of everyone, not just the Jewish people, not just followers, but not just Gentiles, but even a Gentile centurion who's just killed Jesus. This is Mark's way of saying that Jesus' death has been for everyone even the person who's just caused Jesus' death. So Jesus' identity is that he is the Messiah. He's the one who brings the kingdom. He's the one who is God's son with this amazing authority. And his destiny is to walk the way of the cross. And in his living and dying, to bring uh, the world salvation. So let me, uh, let me stop there and I will stop sharing my screen. And perhaps it's time 